Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. And tonight we're beginning the study of the book of Ephesians. So if you don't have your Bible ready, get it now and we'll be starting in just a minute. Uh, let's say hello to the congregation first, though. Uh, Sister Renee, are you untwisted now? I am getting untwisted. All twisted up from church. All right, here we go. Oh, I want to say happy 25th birthday to Mike McGregor today. Happy 25th birthday. Happy uh, birthday, Mike. Yeah. And um, also, I wanted to bless everyone. Uh, tell you, I'm feeling quite a bit better. Not 100%, but I'm feeling quite a bit better. And I am happy to be back and excited to be starting this book. All right. All right, then. How about you, Brother Cripps? Uh, I'm, I'm great. Looking forward to the study tonight. And I'll say hello to everyone in the chat. I hope everyone had a good good week since last Monday and a good weekend. Uh, for everyone that's hanging in there with all the craziness in the world. And uh, can't get wait. Can't wait to see what uh, what Paul has to say to the church in Ephesians. All right, thank you, and uh, brother Ben. Yes, I'm also looking to uh, looking forward to the studying starting a new book. Um, I think this is about as long as Galatians. Both are pretty short, I believe. Um, but I'm looking forward to uh, starting a new new uh, epistle. Good to be here. Okay, amen to that. Well, uh, I'm very happy to introduce to everybody tonight uh, Sister Justine, who's in the chat room. Um, I'm so happy you're here, Justine. Um, for those of you who don't know who Justine is, uh, she and I go way back. Um, we were co-workers. Uh, uh, we were both dealers. We dealt blackjack together at the Treasure Island Casino in Las Vegas. Uh, and then I went into the management and I was a supervisor of uh, working with Justine. But um, somehow Justine and I started talking about the Bible and Jesus and I decided that I should have a Bible study at my house. So Justine and a handful of others from the workplace started coming to my home and doing the Bible studies. And eventually that grew into a home congregation, home church for about seven years. Um, that was a wonderful, wonderful time. So uh, that's Justine. And uh, so I welcome sister. Uh, all right, let's get uh, into the scriptures. Uh, we are here, our KJV firstists. So we'll read the KJV first, and then I'll get your, your thoughts on it, sister Renee. Ephesians, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Sister well, I love this opening. These are clearly children of God, he is addressing. In addition, it's another uh, place in which Paul's apostleship is confirmed based on God choosing him himself. We saw several places where he didn't receive the revelation of the gospel from men, but from Jesus Christ himself. Mm. Here he confirms that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So I'm sick of these people calling him a false apostle. The Muslims have the same thing. They call Paul a false apostle and a liar because he claimed that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was in the Old Testament. And it is. It is. Besides Isaiah 53, it says, the, and Messiah, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Daniel, Nehemiah, Zechariah, they all talk about that. So um, they love to call Paul a false apostle. People that hate the gospel of grace hate Paul. They try to get rid of him. They try to compare Jesus's words to Paul and claim 
that they are different when actually Jesus himself is speaking through Paul because he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. You either accept the Bible is inspired by God or you do not. You don't get to pick and choose it. So we see apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father. They are children of God and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, again, Jesus is the Lord. You don't make him the Lord. Your obedience doesn't make him more or less of the Lord. He is the Lord, divine God manifest in the flesh, name above all names. So I love this opening. It confirms his apostleship. It confirms he's speaking to saved, uh, sealed believers in Ephesus. I also want to remind you the climate in first century Ephesus. Ephesus was famous for the goddess Diana. Their big temple had a statue, a massive statue of Diana. Uh, and there was a lot of temple prostitution, fertility, goddess worship. And a lot of that stuff was trying to come into the early church as well. Uh, Paul rebukes them for these things. But I just wanted to let you know that the climate here in Ephesus was very hostile towards what Paul was preaching. Paul preached against idolatry. This is where they imprisoned Paul uh, because the men who were metal workers were losing money because people stopped buying idols for their home. See, there used to be a giant idol in the temple, and then you would bring a household idol where you would offer it food, and when you ate, you would uh, pledge your food to the idol and leave an offering for it. That's where he talks about things offered to idols, sacrifice to idols. This is what they did. And so because they were losing money, they lied about Paul and got him in prison. So that is what's going on in the climate of first century Ephesus. I just want you to know what he's up against and to have a context of what's happening. All right, thank you. Appreciate you doing that because I uh, I failed to uh, I ask us to do an introduction to the book. Uh, normally, we when we start a new book, we take a few minutes at least to give like an introduction. So uh, I, let me ask you, Brother Cripps, to give us your introduction uh, thoughts on the book and then respond to the first two verses. Okay. Well, well, I can't do any better than Renee just did. She she really laid the groundwork for it, but um. I, all I can do is agree. I mean, it's just an introductory, uh, when I say just, like I said, I, I, I can't think of a way to fill it in more than Renee just did. Um, but yeah, so uh, he's he definitely declares he's an apostle. I agree with that. He states it, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He states it. Uh, of course, we have more proof than that with epistles that we've read where he has to keep coming back and proving over and over and, over and, and going back to it saying, hey, this is why I'm a this is why I'm a disciple. I, you know, the, the gospel I didn't get from man. I got from straight from Jesus um, and uh, uh, regaling us with uh, where he studied, how long he stayed in certain places, things like that. Um, I, that Unfortunately, I don't have much else to add to that. It's just uh, introductory. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, of course, we know this is uh, the Apostle Paul's book, one of, another one of the Pauline epistles. An epistle is a letter. Uh, so Paul wrote a letter and sent it to this church uh, in Ephesus. Uh, and Paul was in prison when he wrote this. This is one of what they call the prison epistles. Um, it's uh, pretty much agreed upon that this was written somewhere between 64 and 67 uh, A.D., um, it, um, you know, we talk about our, all of our favorite epistles, but there's a lot of good arguments that this is one of the greatest, most important theological, um, books of the Bible. Um, there are some main things that, uh, uh, there's only six chapters, but, uh, they say that the first three chapters are about, uh, uh, being the believers, uh, being in Christ and also being in heaven. And then the next three chapters, four, four, five, and six, are about the believer's life. So it would be 
uh, our discipleship or or, or our walk as a Christian. Uh, And and in the beginning, it's uh, what is Christianity? Um, And and, uh, how do we stand? We are in Christ and we're also already in heaven. Um, So these are some of the main uh, things that we're going to be uh, covering as we go forward. Also, there's a distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles and that there's a, uh, a wall of partition that will have to come down that uh, we learn about in this book. But the opening remarks, um, let me just read it in the um, Amplified and see what it, how it phrases it, verses uh, 1 and 2. Uh, Paul, an apostle, that is a special messenger, personally chosen representative of Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed by the will of God, that is, by his purpose and choice, to the saints, that is, God's people, who are at Ephesus, and are faithful and loyal and steadfast in Christ Jesus. Uh, Grace to you and peace, that is, inner calm and spiritual well-being from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Well, it's a beautiful uh, greeting, I'd love to hear that kind of greeting from from anybody. Uh, could you imagine if Paul had written you? And we should, I guess that's how we should look at this, that Paul is writing to us. This is his sentiments, not just to Ephesus, but to us, even today. So this is his uh, beautiful opening re- remarks. Uh, the, the thing that... Um, I don't want to say it bothers me, but I know that uh, some people will always take an opportunity to uh, attack the the Lord or the gospel. And in, in verse 2, when Paul makes the distinction, he says, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, um, there are those who would take this phrase and argue that, see, there's God and then there's the Lord Jesus. But... Uh, uh, to those people who do not believe in the deity of Christ will take this as an opportunity to attack the deity of Christ just because of the way it's it's uh, uh, phrased. The only way they can do that is to not read the whole of Scripture. Yeah. That's all. That'd be, that'd be cherry picking. It's, Brother Luke, you've made it very clear in the verses that, that I've seen you compile uh, from all over the Bible that, that make it very clear that Jesus is God. Mm-hmm. I mean, I believed it for that. I'm just saying that you you have several verses that you can uh, spit mm-hmm. out at someone that tries to make this point. Oh yeah, it's uh, the deed of Christ, faith alone for salvation, and eternal security. The the core doctrines of Christianity. These are so clearly, explicitly stated and repeated over and over again that mm-hmm. there should be no confusion. Right. There should be no doubt as to what the the core. Uh, uh, principles and doctrines of Christianity are. And right. The deity of Christ is certainly what's perfectly established, and anybody who doesn't see it and believe it is uh, they're, they're spiritually blind. Yeah, and willful, willfully ignorant. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, any more before we go to the next verse? Okay. No, sure. All right. Let's go to uh, verse three. And I don't know if I need to read any further. It looks like there's no period there. And there's, boy, it looks like four verses connected. But let me try to read one of them and see if it if it will make sense. Uh, Brother Cripps, uh, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So I suppose they would do the same thing with this verse then, because it refers to... Uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord. It's not saying that Jesus is God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, I just don't think like that because I already I believe He's God. I already believe He's God. So I'm not looking at each each verse uh, trying to see how they would twist it. Um, but there are other people on the panel that are better at that than I am for sure. <laughs> when it gets around to uh, when it gets around to Renee, maybe she'll be able to see it. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Uh, gosh, isn't that true? Uh, he blesses us all the time. Those that believe in him, he continues to bless us all throughout our life. Uh, growth um, to uh, produce fruits in us. Uh, love, joy, peace. We've all we've gone over those recently. 
uh, uh, those working in our lives and spreading those on to other people, being salt and light. All those things are our spiritual blessings, um, especially faith, spiritual blessing from God. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So we get those from Christ. John said uh, that uh, our joy is from Christ, which is a which is an amazing thing. Uh, it's not something you think about a whole lot, but uh, the very joy that we have is Christ's joy. It's not our joy. We don't create the joy ourselves. So that's an interesting thing. I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Sister Renee. Yep. Hold on one second here. Well, here's the thing. You know, I've used the verse, we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, because I, I want people to remember our positional standing. It's as if we're already there. You know, uh, people don't understand our security in Christ. But this one says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Um, that's where you stopped, right? Yep. Okay. That little, that little uh, semicolon, I, I couldn't remember if we went past it. But I think it's important that everything we have, we're complete in Christ. And our spiritual blessings are also in Christ. Um, and he clearly says we have them. Uh, and also in other places, he says not everyone has the same gifts. You know, um, we're one body, many members. And some are teachers and some are healers and some are prayer warriors. But we're all just as important working as a unit. But whatever our, our duty, whatever our purpose as part of his body we are given those spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. He gives us, equips us to do it. Okay, thank you. Brother Cripps, let me read that in the Amplified. Verse 3 says, uh, Blessed and worthy of praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. Yeah, I went first on this one. Oh, you did? Yeah, you. Did, but it's okay. You didn't read the Amplified, but I went first. Oh, okay. All right, then. Uh, well, you know, the interesting thing about this word blessed, um, uh, I think it's fair to, to translate it as um, happy. Anytime you see the word blessed, you can replace it with happy. And, and so in this case, it's talking about God being happy. Blessed be the God. So God is blessed. Could you imagine God? What does God need? Anything? I mean, come on. Is there anything that God needs to be happy? Uh, and yet he can be happier, apparently, or less happy, because as in this case, he's really happy about something. Uh, blessed be the God uh, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then who hath blessed us? So could it be that God is happy? that he is going to be able to make us happy by blessing us or make uh, who had made us happy with all spiritual blessings uh, in heavenly places. Now in heavenly places, of course, I think it's going to probably go into more detail, but uh, there, uh, this is the idea of that uh, we're uh, not only uh, um, um, here, you know, but we are all ready presently in heavenly places. Uh, uh, I don't understand how to explain that. I, if anybody has an explanation for it, but the Bible says that we are already seated in heavenly places with Christ. You got an answer for me on that one, Rene or Cripps? My answer would uh, stretch everyone's brains to the limit. I. I believe God is outside of time, and I believe that um, in in one way we are already there. I really do. I believe that the uh, the apostles that got a chance to go up and see it, they're not seeing a video screen. They're seeing it actually take place, and God put them in that time to be able to see it. 
uh, for instance, uh, John, when he's seeing all the, the end. For us, the end hasn't taken place yet. I mean, it, it, we have yet for that to happen in this realm. But I believe when the angel took John up to see these things, get on up here, you know, and, and see these things. He took him up there to see it. When he saw it, it was when it was actually taking place. Uh, it, it doesn't say that. So this is just my opinion. Um, but it also doesn't say that he saw it in a dream or um, like on some screen somewhere. Uh, he may have even seen himself seated there. Uh, it doesn't say that either, but it's possible. So when Paul went up, I think the same thing. I think he was seeing uh, future future stuff. That's my opinion. All right. Thanks. Renee, do you have any thoughts on that? Repeat your question. I want to make sure I answer this right. Well, you know, we are in Christ right now. Uh, and the Bible says we're already seated in heavenly places, right? Uh-huh. Um, and the Bible says that we we can't we can't help but sin. And the right. Bible says it's impossible for us to sin. Right. Um, so maybe you could elaborate on those uh, how that all that's possible. Yeah. Uh, well, the flesh is not born of God. Flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom. Uh, we're supposed to uh, acknowledge that it already died. So our the old Renee, she's dead. This body is dead, and that's how we're supposed to reckon ourselves and alive unto Christ to live in righteousness. That is our identity in him because the spirit is born of God and we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus because we are in him. Just like we, we, we're the righteousness of God in Christ. It's all because we're in Christ. It's not uh, us at all. The Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in us and we are in him. So I think it's a, it's like a spiritual mystery, you know, because baptism represents that I died, I was buried and I rose again with Christ. So I was in Christ on the cross. All my sin was in Christ on the cross and he carried that. And uh, by the way, I was talking to Brooke earlier and I said, it's ridiculous. These people talk about, he only covers your sins till you believe. Now you're really scared. Well, you still sin. So what was the blood? The Bible tells us he died once for all and we're perfected forever. And so 2000 years ago, Renee's sins, all of them were in Christ. They were all on Jesus. All of them. He didn't say, I'm going to stop covering her sins when she hits 50. It's silliness. So I believe, uh, like uh, Jason was saying, he's eternal. He's outside of time. And there's a part of us that is in him spiritually. It's something we cannot understand. Our spirit has been regenerated, regened, new DNA, spiritual DNA in Christ. And it's born of God and it cannot sin. That's the one that gets into heaven. And one day that spirit will be joined to a perfect glorified body. Then we will be perfect. Right now we see through the glass darkly. Amen. Thank you. All right. Let me move to verse four in the KJV. It says, uh, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Sister Renee, can you decalvinize that for us? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, man, they have a ball with this, don't they? All right, here. Let several, me several, Renee. You know something that came to me looking at this verse? What's not being said? This verse does not say, according as he has chosen us to be in him before the foundation of the world. It says he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Do you see? So all those who are in Christ, he has chosen to be adopted as sons. He doesn't say, I've chosen them to be in my son. He says he has chosen us in him, not to be in him. That's predestination of choosing people to be saved or not. He chose the saved people, those that were in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. 
So those that are in Christ, he chose us to be holy and without blame before him. Big difference than saying he chose us to be in him. He chose us in him. So those of us that are in Christ, he chose us to be holy and blameless before him in love. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. All right. Brother Cripps. Uh, yeah. So I, I would, first of all, I would agree with Renee. I'm not a Calvinist. I do think that the Calvinists do have some things right, but I don't uh, agree with, uh, with uh, most of it, and I think they take things too far. Anybody can do that. They can take something that's true and take it too far to the point where they make conclusions that I, I believe aren't from God at all. Uh, so that's the problem. And I, I know how much uh, Brother Luke detests them, and I understand why he does. Uh, but some things they have, I agree with. Um, uh, but this particular thing, I mean, I've, I've gone through all these verses, these uh, chosen and predestined and, and all that stuff, and I like the way Renee explained it. Uh, it also could, I would, I would add, it could also be referring simply according as he hath cho uh, chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. You could say that's the subject uh, that he chose. And there's other verses that talk about he established good works for us, that we should do them before the foundations of the, wor uh, of, the of the world. So uh, you could make the argument, as Ben likes to say, you could make the argument we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's what was set up uh, before the foundations of the chosen, the, the works. Uh, make an argument for that. Holy and without blame before him in love. Similar to what Renee was saying, that that's the part that's chosen. He's chosen us in him, yes, but what was chosen before the foundation of the world, uh, as another verse that we've read uh, goes over, the works that we should do in love. That's all. All right. Thank you. Well, every time that there's a verse that uh, Calvinists uh, use to pro promote their um, evil philosophy, is what I would have to call it, um, uh, I, we are obligated, I think, to point out that uh, this is a verse that Calvinists will twist. And uh, so we do need to take some time to clarify it. But um, every one of the problems with Calvinism, though, could easily uh, end up in a discussion of several hours at least. Uh, there, are, there is so much to be said against it. Um, but um, right, since we've got a Bible study to do, um, I, I'm going to encourage everybody to, uh, if you go to the homepage for the church channel and, and also on my channel, Brother Luke, there are recommended channels. And I've added two to it recently. Uh, one's called Soteriology 101, mm -hmm. the channel by Leighton Flowers. And the other one is uh, Beyond the Fundamentals. Uh, and um, I'll think of his name in a minute, but uh, he's also very good. These are, I think, the two best channels to uh, explain to you what Calvinism is and, and why it's wrong. So uh, I encourage everybody, if you're, if you want to know really all about Calvinism, get, get it from people who are the former Calvinists who left and really understand it and, and uh, uh, really know biblically how to show that, that it's all wrong. Um, but the point that you made, Crips, I agree with your conclusion, is that uh, the thing that is uh, chosen, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blame and without blame. Yeah. So uh, the fact that we're going to be holy is what he is uh, 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 decreeing. Mm -hmm. um, and just as uh, when we get to other verses like that, we find out that when he talks about predestination, predestination is not that we're predestined to be saved, but the fact that all those who are saved are predestined to be glorified. Look at what the Amplified says about uh, that verse. I was trying to avoid it, brother. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't, don't listen to me then. Didn't you notice that I I, I omitted it? Or didn't you wonder? Yeah, I was like, you didn't read it. Is it Calvinistic? Yeah, it is. It is. I was trying to. Unfortunately, as, as helpful as the uh, Amplified can be, uh, you know, there are cases where we find out some either works. Uh, uh, heresy or a uh, 
Uh, in this case, there's a Calvinist uh, interpretation, so I guess I'll read it now. It says, uh, um, just as in his love he chose us in Christ, actually selected us for himself as his own before the foundation of the world, uh, uh, so that we would be holy, that is, consecrated, set apart for him, purpose-driven and blameless in his sight. Um, so the second part of that is what he's uh, choosing is for and, and uh, you know, decreeing. It's not the, the first part, but, okay. All right, any oh. more? We go to the next verse. Well, sure. It's not right. The Amplified isn't right all the time. And they're, they're, it seems like they're choosing to take a, a Calvinistic view of this particular verse. And uh, that it's troublesome because there's a couple in this passage, uh, a couple in Ephesians, actually. Um, you know, I hate that too, Jason. Uh, ben made a, a neat way of explaining it. Remember how I said, Look, it doesn't say chosen us to be in him. Right. I said, chosen us in him. And Ben made a good point in the chat. He said, Christ is the chosen one and we're chosen in him. So it, it makes better sense that way. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. and so we're chosen in him from the foundation because he's the chosen one. Mm -hmm. But uh I am very disappointed that they took a Calvinistic approach to this. Yeah. We're, like we're chosen to be in him. And so yeah. They, because they come right out and state it. Yeah. Yeah. So that would mean that Jesus chose people. It means that the Calvinist would be, if, if that verse is correct, the way that they've interpreted it, it means that Jesus chooses, picks and chooses yep. who believes and who doesn't. Yep. And that, that means that there are people out there that, are blameless because God just picked and choose. He yep. didn't choose them. Yep. So it means yesterday they can say, Hey, you didn't pick me to choose. Right. Why are you condemning me for it? Yeah. They, they, they would have excuse. The Bible says they're without excuse. So it would mean that the Bible is lying. It means God's lying. It means all, all the other people that have talked about the way this works, they're all lying. It, it would all be garbage if that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me go on to the next verse. And uh, it's uh, verse uh, five. Um, whose turn is to go first this time, Renee? It's me. Crips. Okay. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. I'll finish the sentence. Okay. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So five and six. Okay. So uh, now I don't interpret this as a Calvinist would. I would say having predestined us into the adoption, it means the whole process of adoption as children was established through Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Not that he's predestined all his children into adoption. But the whole process was thought of before. I mean, there are many verses that talk about these things being planned long before. That this was not a second thought of God. God didn't look at the way men were developing in the earth and say, "Oh, I need to provide them a Messiah." Oh, yeah, I forgot. No, this this is this has all been planned. So I believe in this verse. Paul is saying, "Having predestinated us into the adoption," meaning this was this was something he had already planned. Uh, and Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And then verse six, to the praise and glory of his grace, wherein we uh, have made us accepted in the beloved. Now he goes on about that in, uh, in uh, Romans, one of my favorite uh, chapters. I've said many times, uh, chapter five, um, we stand in his grace, uh, uh, wherein he hath made us accepted in, in, in the beloved. So he's, he's done this through his grace. And we have that through faith in Jesus Christ. So that that's the that's the way we get there. That's a mechanism by which we get there. But it, it's it's been set up a long time ago for us. That's a great explanation. Uh, that is a great explanation of that verse. What was predestinated is the process of the adoption of humans. Uh, the way we are accepted is because we're in the beloved. 
And so the way God predestined adoption of human beings as his children mm -hmm. was from the foundation of the world. He knew those in Christ would be adopted as sons. Amen. So, uh, I like how you said that um, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So mm -hmm. again, I believe that what you said was correct, that what was predestinated was the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Not who would be adopted, right? but the adoption of children. And so that that path uh, is, is his will, that it's his will that we would be adopted by being in Christ to the praise of the glory of his grace. Amen. So that then nobody is in there through their works, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. So the way that we would be accepted as his children is predestinated. The process is predestinated of adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. That's the, I, I like how you put that. It's the actual adoption process and what makes us accepted that was predestinated. Amen. The process of it. Uh, so, uh, because that's how his grace gets the glory. So yeah, that's why it says to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. Yeah. And the, uh, to add to that, the, it would still be true that God gets glory if he did choose. But then there are some other complications, as we mentioned before, which was people would have an excuse if, if they could throw their hands up, and say, well, I didn't get chosen. I wasn't predestinated. What am I supposed to do? No matter what I believe or, or what I do, nothing's going to work. So they have an excuse. So I, I think it's a it's a clear way to look at it. And you can do that with every election verse. And, and one more thing. Doesn't it seem like if it was true that God chose us, that it would be more clear? Don't you think that someone in scripture would say, God, look, God chose you. You don't have any, you don't have any choice in the matter. You have no, no free will, nothing. He he picks and chooses who he wants to. And I know there's some verses that that people kind of take out of context to, to make that point. But if this was true that God shows you, I, I feel like it would be made clear in scripture. It, it, it wouldn't be obscure. You know what, Jason, the bottom line is this. They like to say unconditional election. Yet everyone deep down thinks there's something special or good in them that made God choose them. Amen. Especially Every Calvary. Every one of them. Every, Every one. one of them thinks they're elect. They can say unconditional all they want to, but you won't really hear a Calvinist say, I'm not one of the elect. Right. They will say, I hope I'm one of the elect. I'll find out if I persevere to the end. But every one of them thinks that they are elect because there's something good in them, really. They right. say they say that's not true, but you can see it. You can see it. Yeah. I do know a couple of what I would consider good Calvinists that uh, that they they believe the Calvinist uh, stuff, but uh, you know that they aren't as haughty as other ones that I've met. But that doesn't mean that they have the right doctrine, though. Still, they're they're they don't focus so much on themselves, uh, just just the tenets, the tulip or whatever. I have a real problem with limited atonement, though. Okay, um, the, this is my shirt tonight. It's just very well. I want you to know about it. Can you can you see it? Believer, believer. Okay, and it's relevant because um, there is an order that happens. Uh, uh, that uh, if you understand this, then uh, you will not uh, fall into the trap of, of Calvinism. Uh, the, the order is that God graciously provides salvation, eternal life for us. We believe, when we believe, then we um, get regenerated. Our uh, spirit is brought to life. Uh, I, I believe this is the first resurrection, the resurrection of our spirit. Our spirit is born again. Uh, from above, 
Um, uh, but believing precedes regeneration. We believe, and because we believe, the Spirit indwells, is, uh, baptizes us, indwells us, seals us, brings our spirit to life. And, and uh, uh, the, this is the order that things happen. Uh, and then after that, of course, the process of growing and maturing and eventually getting a glorified body, these are all things that uh, were promised that uh, were predestined. We're predestined that those people who did believe and were regenerated and now are children of God, they are destined to uh, reach this uh, point where the Lord has says, you're going to be perfect physically, spiritually, in every way. Uh, and, and have eternal life. Uh, but the Calvinists, they say, no, uh, you're, um, you're dead spiritually, and that means a dead man can't do anything. That's how they phrase it. But um, it, it's really a, a stupid argument because if we're, if a person's not born again uh, as, as a Christian, uh, just your average, you know, lost person, um, Nobody would argue that they're not capable of doing anything because they're dead. I mean, actually, look, their their heart's pumping, they're breathing, they're thinking, they're reasoning, they're making decisions, they're they're living lives. So they certainly are capable. They can't be dead in the sense that the Calvinists want to make us think that they're dead. That means they're incapable of understanding and believing. Um, so um, they are capable, um, but the Calvinist says. No, the total inability. They do not have the ability to understand and believe the gospel uh, until God uh, regenerates them. In other words, God has to impose the whole, the Holy Spirit has to force his way into you, even though you haven't believed. If the Holy Spirit forces himself on you, brings your spirit to life, and now you're with you, now that you have a laboring spirit. Now you're capable of believing. So that they, they reverse it. They say regeneration precedes believing. And we say, no, believing precedes regeneration. Uh, so that's the important to understand that this, this is a major distinction between Calvinism and the rest of the world, the way that, uh, and that understanding the order, as, as the Bible tells us, the order of these, these things will clear this up. Uh, if I might comment on that, it, it, it that's spiritual rape. That would be spiritual rape. Mm -hmm. That would be against the the oh. will the will He gave us, and God doesn't do that. He doesn't force anyone. First of all, He doesn't force anyone to believe anything. He nope. doesn't force belief on us. Nope. Nope. We're convinced by the evidence. He 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 does out of His love and grace. He presents the evidence. The evidence is there through Scripture. Yep. I, I believe it's there through working in our lives and showing us things, showing us that he's there, uh, especially mm -hmm. for those that seek him. The Bible makes that clear, especially if we're seeking him. He promises that he will be found by those that seek him. No doubt. So that's, that's whosoever will. Whosoever will. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have an atheist friend that claimed after the death of someone he loved, he went out into like the forest and fasted 20 days asking God to show himself. And I said, honey, I'm on the phone here now. He doesn't answer when you call, but you did seek. And now I'm answering for you. I'm telling you who God is through Christ. Amen. He answered your prayer, honey. I'm right here. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you. Yeah. He didn't show up in the forest, but he showed up on his timing. And I'm telling you now. But yeah. because he didn't show up how he wanted him to in that forest those 20 days. He has rejected God. Sadly. Mm -hmm. Um, by the way, the the reason I felt I had to go into that explanation is because the verse says, um, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. So we're predestined to be adopted. But this this adoption uh, is, is uh, uh, happens after we believe. So that's why understanding these, what happens is, the first is God does his part. He graciously provides it and offers it. Our part, we believe. And, and when that happens, now we get the Holy Spirit bringing our spirit to life. And now the next thing, of course, is we get adopted. So uh, because we believed, 
we, now we're predestinated since we believe now we get adopted yep he prayed he predestinated all who believe for a purpose that yeah. that's the whole point here yeah. he didn't predestine us to be saved he predestined saved people to their purpose and this is part of the purpose being adopted yeah. and been accepted in the beloved and that was established before the foundation of the earth. Yeah. All the processes yeah. that God uses. Amen. Yeah. All right. Let's go to uh, verse uh, uh, seven in the KJV. It says, "In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace." Verse eight, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Well, I'm going to stop there. Uh, seven and eight. Uh, is it Crips' turn? It's Renee. I did that. Okay. You know what? This is powerful, you guys. This is powerful because our redemption is according to the riches of his grace. I am so sick of people saying that if you don't sin control, that it, you lose your salvation or something. They have no idea that our sins were all on Christ. All of them. I wasn't even born when he died. He's outside of time. Sin of the whole world was put on him, forward and backwards. Everybody's going to live, and every and it says even the past sins before the cross. It doesn't mean past right now when you believed. It's past before the cross. That's what he's talking about, sins of the past that were forgiven. So here, when it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, redeemed means purchased you ever gone to a pawn shop and you get a redemption ticket it, it means you go there and you redeem the item you make payments on it and then you redeem it you, it's yours it's purchased so he redeemed us if you read the story of roots it's a picture of christ being the kinsman redeemer and it's really important to understand what redemption means we have redemption through his blood. That's how he paid for us. The forgiveness of sins. Why? Because his blood purged our sins. According to the riches of his grace, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Okay, wherein what? In his grace. According to the riches of his grace, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Because it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption of his, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. So in Christ and in grace. That's the wherein. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Brother Cripps, let me see if the amplify is safe for us now. Yeah, let's see if they're back on track, Brother Luke. Yeah, okay, seven and eight in the Amplified says, uh, in him we have redemption, that is, our deliverance and salvation, through his blood, which paid the penalty for our sin and resulted in the forgiveness and complete pardon of our sin in accordance with the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and understanding with practical insight. That's pretty good. I don't, I don't see any problem there. Renee did a really good job of explaining it. Yeah, so in whom we have redemption now, in whom is Christ through his blood. That's the that's the thing that saved uh, the, the shedding of his blood that needed to happen for us for the forgiveness of sins. We couldn't do it. That's why God sent his son into the world. Again, if we could do it, he would have not needed to have sacrificed his son, and he would not have done it. If we could do it by... Uh, obeying the law, and we could be holy as he is holy in and of ourselves. We don't need uh, uh, Christ's help with anything. I uh, wouldn't, wouldn't have needed to send him. So I think that's clear. Uh, through the riches uh, of his grace, um, wherein he hath abounded toward us all wisdom and prudence. Uh, yeah, so he, he gives us these things uh toward us in all wisdom and prudence god is wise and prudent we aren't but he gives that uh to us just like he grows fruits in us uh the more we study the more we get close to him the more wisdom i believe as believers he uh he gives to us uh he's he's making us into the likeness of christ 
uh, as we've mentioned earlier, I believe the spirit, is, uh, as I think it was Brother Luke that said, the spirit, the, the spirit never sins. Completely agree with that. The, the part of us that never sins, the, the soul is what is being uh, worked on and changed and sanctified. There are three steps of sanctification. We're sanctified the moment we believe. We're in a process of sanctification of our soul. That means our our will, mind, uh, thought, and emotions, all that stuff is being changed into the likeness of Christ. And then, uh, because we still have to carry the flesh around with us, it's a constant battle for most of us. So I'll speak for myself, it's a constant battle for me, maybe not everyone else. Uh, choosing every day to walk in the spirit instead of the flesh while I have this pesky flesh attached to me. Uh, but out of the grace of God, in the end, I'll get an eternal body, which uh, will not struggle with these things. So my perfect spirit that never sins will be uh, joined with my uh, uh, perfect body and my soul that has been completely converted at that point because it has no more attachment to this flesh. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, let me move to the next verse since I, I can't add anything to what you've said. It, it says uh, in verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So uh, that's uh, nine and 10 for... One of you. <laughs> Me. It's, it, I it's my I turn. I can remember which one went first. All right. All right. Verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. These are all the things that we're studying. We're, we're learning the mystery of his will, all things. All things he intended to do, the the fact that before the foundation of the, uh, the earth, he knew that he would send his son uh, as the Messiah. Adam sinned. Uh, through one man, all sin entered into the into the world, and through one man, Jesus, all sin was paid for, and that's the uh, part of the mystery of His will. I think is huge. I, I don't know if there's anyone that fully understands uh, His will. Uh, I think we'll have eternity to fully understand it, and then after, I I, I know there's no time <laughs> supposedly in heaven, but uh, after ten thousand years, we still won't understand it fully. I don't believe. But we'll have all that time to do that. And then verse 10, this this is a problem verse uh, for a universalist, uh, especially I've heard them use this verse. And for here's a dispensation for those people that believe in dispensation. But I believe all it's saying is that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, when the, when the time was right, that's the way I interpret it, that he might gather in all, all things in Christ. Now, this is the universalist part, all things. They say that... Uh, that uh, God will reconcile everyone, all things to him, including in this verse, both which are in heaven, and which are on earth, even in him. Uh, I am not a universalist, but uh, I have at least one uh, dear friend who uh, in all ways uh, believes many of the same things I do, but he believes that uh, God will reconcile uh, everyone. All, all the wicked and evil, they're not annihilated, they're not in eternal torment, whatever you believe as far as that's concerned. Uh, that they that the um, the lake of fire is a crucible for those folks. Uh, of course, don't go there. Uh, doesn't want anyone to go to the lake of fire, but the lake of fire will purge you of uh, all that uh, stuff that you had an opportunity on earth to to do and reconcile all things. They say all things uh, back to God. So that's a uh, maybe Renee can expound on a little bit better than I did, but that's I'll stop there. Yeah, right. I, I don't think it's making a, you know, I agree with Jason on this. I don't think it's making a universal statement. Uh, it doesn't take away our choice. Um, so having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his will, is that all be saved, that Jesus would be lifted up. He would draw men unto him. Right. And right. through him, we might be saved. And the might is conditioned upon faith. So that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, all that means is to dispense. Right. To dispense. And God is dispensing grace right now. And in the dispensation in the fullness of times, right, 
when he when he planned it. It's exactly when God planned it. He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. I, I think all he's saying is that his sacrifice has fixed creation. That uh, the blood atonement of Jesus has fixed what the first, as the second Adam, Jesus has reversed the curse of the first Adam. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he's uh, gathering together in one, all things in Christ, which both are in heaven, which are in earth, even in him. That is all of creation is being fixed. And we know that there's going to be new heaven and a new earth that, that the, the creation itself is groaning. So I think that's all it's talking about. I think it's talking about all those that are in him by faith, including the whole um, uh, creation as well. Amen. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, let me read those verses in the Amplify. It says um, 9 and 10. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ with regard to the fulfillment of the times, that is the end of history, yeah. the climax of the ages, to bring all things together in Christ, both things in the heavens and things on the earth. Mm. So, um, yeah, that's an agreement with the point you just made, Renee. Um, the, uh, the thing about this word mystery, though, um, mystery is something that we're going to be talking a lot more about in this book of Ephesians. Uh, but uh, in this case, the word mystery is talking about the mystery of his will. Um, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. Uh, now, first of all, here's something that might surprise people is that um, God's will uh, is not always done. Um, this is another problem with, with Calvinism, is that they they take the concept of the sovereignty of God, and by the way, <laughs> uh, in case you didn't know this, um, the word sovereign or sovereignty is not in the Bible, and at least it's not in the KJ version. Um, it doesn't mean that the concept of sovereignty is not in the Bible. I, I, I believe sovereignty of God is, is, is true, but how would you define it? Calvinists, I believe, are defining as what I call hyper-sovereignty. They're taking sovereignty to such an extreme that they turn God into, instead of the God of love and mercy and justice, into an, an evil, sadistic uh, puppet master. Um, Yes. So um, uh, even though um, God is sovereign, he made a sovereign decision to give us free will and not impose his will on us so that we have our own will. Now, it is his desire. The Bible says that uh, do not think God is slack in his promise and not desiring or willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Um does that mean that uh, because it's God's will or God's desire that everybody come to repentance, that they will? No. No. Uh, we have free will. We don't have to. Even though God desires it, it's God's will. It's God's uh, great hope. And, and, and of course, he, he knows the outcome. So it's not like he's surprised by this. Right. But it's uh, even though he wants everybody to be saved, he knows it's not going to happen. And because he gave us free will. Why would he give us free will uh, if, if uh, all he has to do is impose his will and he gets his way? <laughs> because uh, only with free will uh, can we actually have a love relationship with God. That's why God made us, to love us. And, right. uh, and the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. So our natural response is when we understand this great love God has for us, so much that he would die for us and did. And yet our, our response automatically to be love him, love him in return. Um, and, and then that is real love because it was not imposed. Um, Amen. All right. All right. Anything I, like the, I like the way you put that. That's all. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, that was good. Okay. Let's go to verse um, uh, 12. Um, 
It's Renee's turn. Yeah. Well, verse, verse 13 and 14, Renee, I'll read those. In whom ye also trusted. After that, ye heard the word of the truth, uh, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believe, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, uh, that's verse, I'll read 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Mm. Remember earlier I said there's a sequence of events? This yeah. is that tells us the sequence of these events, Renee. And this is one of my favorite quotable sections. I use it a lot. However, I think we might have missed a couple verses, didn't we? Uh, in whom we have obtained a being predestined because of verse that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Did we say that? Yeah, we we're supposed to do 11. Okay. I, you just, you, so I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read it. I thought I did 11 when I was talking about his will. No, um, or maybe it's, I did. Okay. It's the one above. Uh, uh, you went back up to nine, Brother Luke, to explain. Oh, that. yeah, I went to nine and ten. I'm sorry. Go so, ahead and do 11 all the way through uh, 14, sister. Yeah, this is important because it shows us that believing means to trust him. Mm -hmm. Believing, pistios, is a trust to rely upon. Yes. To know something to be true and trust in it. And so those of us who trusted in christ what does that mean i trusted my soul in his hands yes. I trusted that his blood on calvary paid my sin debt and so therefore i have eternal life because of what christ suffered for me mm. and because he rose again from the dead it proves that his blood was accepted on my behalf and i will rise too mm -hmm. so that means we have trusted in christ Amen. That we've trusted we have eternal life in him and this is his promise Okay, that's why I come against these people that say you can lose it and you got to live a certain way to keep right. it. It's work salvation, people. I don't care how they word it. I don't care how they say it's grace through faith, but this or the uh, grace uh, believing is actually obeying. I don't care how they twist it, people. It's based on trusting what Christ did on Calvary, period. And yeah. right here, Paul is confirming, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. We have it. Yeah. Now we own it. Mm -hmm. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Doesn't mean we were predestinated to be saved. It means those that are saved are predestined to get this inheritance. Yes. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. That is so important. Yep. Now it goes on in whom ye also trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. What was that? What was the gospel of your salvation? If you go to first Corinthians uh, 15, one through four, it says, this is the gospel wherein we stand. The one that saved us, mm -hmm. okay? that Christ yep. died for our sins, according to the scriptures that he was buried and he rose again the third day. That is the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now see, Satan's a counterfeiter. God spiritually seals his people and Satan seals his people in the flesh. We have a spiritual mark, so Satan's going to put a fleshly mark. He is just a copycat of God. And this, uh, this inheritance we have, it says we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. That is like a proof of purchase, a down payment. I think earnest is a financial term. Uh, we might want to pull that up. The earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. And we are the purchased possession. All those that trust Christ or the body of Christ, we are the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So uh, like Brother Luke said, this is a, a list of what happened when you got saved and whom you also trusted. After you heard the word, word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So you heard the gospel, you believed it, you had trusted Christ for your salvation, and you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And that Holy Spirit seal is the earnest of our inheritance until he comes and redeems us bodily. It's like a proof of purchase, a down payment 
of our inheritance, proving that we will have it. We possess it. We don't have it right now, but it's the right. of our inheritance that we will possess it. It's that's a wonderful section. Yeah, that's the perseverance part. You have to persevere in whatever faith it is that you can muster oh, until yeah. the end, and then then you're then you'll know if you're you're saved or not. Yeah. We have it now, man. That's what the you, earnest of our inheritance. Amen. Amen. Oops. Brother Brother Cripps, maybe clarify that that's not your position. So in case someone just heard only that, what? That uh, that position you just took that was that you, you were saying that's the Calvinist position, not yours, right? No, not mine. Yeah, but I I I, I thought I made that clear earlier. I, I I mentioned that earlier. So if someone's just tuning in, yeah, the Calvinists believe that. I'm not. Right. Uh, I was agreeing with Renee in, in against uh, what she was preaching against. I was just thinking that in case someone didn't hear what you said earlier and only heard that, they might think that you're uh, supporting the Calvinist position because they. No. Didn't. I, I, found it, I found in the Greek what earnest means in regards to this. Earnest in regards to a payment, like we're talking about an inheritance. So they use the Greek as a financial term, and it means a large part of the payment given in advance as a security that the whole will be paid later. Boom. You can't get better than that. No. Okay. No. So that's not just to be clear. Then, since you brought it up, it's not persevere. We don't persevere in, like I said, whatever faith we we can muster, like it's ours. That we we hold on to whatever faith and hope the uh, hope that it, in the end we'll find out that we did enough. Because again, it's not what we did; it's what Christ did. That's what we're trusting. We're trusting in that what Christ did was enough. Which I'll say more about when it comes. To yeah. All right, so let me, uh, I'll start with verse 11 and read all that in the Amplified. It says, in him also we have received an inheritance, that is, a destiny. We were claimed by God as his own, having been predestined, that is, chosen, appointed beforehand, according to the purpose of him who works everything in agreement with the counsel and design of his will. Verse 12, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ, who uh, first put our confidence in him as our Lord and Savior, would exist to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, that is the good news of your salvation, and as a result, believed in him, were stamped with the seal of the mm -hmm. promised Holy Spirit, the one promised by Christ as owned and protected by God. Mm. So here in this verse, you have the sequence of this. It says, in him, you also who heard the word of truth. Yeah. So first we hear the gospel. Yeah. Uh, and, and then it says, as a result of hearing it, we believed it. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then when we believed it, we were stamped with the seal of promise, the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So this, I don't know why Calvinists can't read this verse here and not realize that their error, uh, that uh, they're regenerated, then believe, because this says that you hear, you believe, then you're regenerated. Um, I, I, think, I, I think it's a great question, and I think that it's because Satan has twisted the minds of the, those that don't believe, and they don't believe, ultimately, they don't believe what Christ did was enough. They believe that, that that they add something to it, even though they're chosen. They're chosen to uh, do do good works and and persevere in their faith. They've got to hold on to it. They got to run the race and finish, show themselves approved by by what they do. I I think so. It's because their their mind is twisted. Uh, their uh, I I call it the the trap for intellectual. Uh, uh, quote unquote Christians. I mean, yeah, you, you have to really, really uh, dive into the stuff pretty deeply to come to some of the conclusions they do, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's in, inaccurate. The conclusions they've come to is inaccurate. They take some things. This is why it's so dangerous. Well, there, there, and maybe you don't agree with this, brother. Luke. I think that you would. The reason why Calvinism is so dangerous is because 
they're close to the truth in a lot of areas, but the conclusions they draw from it are uh, heresy. Mm, I, I don't agree with that. I, I don't see any of their positions that are even close to the truth at all. It's, uh, I will have to take a, an hour to explain all those reasons to you. But uh, <laughs> Well, I can go watch your playlist. Yeah, that would be a good thing to do. <laughs> or better than me are those two... Uh, those two uh, channels I recommended because, look, I'm not an expert on refuting Calvinism. I know more than most people listening right now, but I don't know as much as Leighton Flowers or uh, Kevin Kevin Thompson. Yeah, right. you know, uh, is it Kevin or Keith? Keith, Keith or Kevin Thompson? Uh, these people and 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 there are plenty of others who are. That is their focal point of their ministry. They know every little verse and every every problem with Calvinism, and uh, they're much better qualified to, to do it than me. Um, but I, to answer your question, no, I don't see them close to the truth on any of the six points. And there's not five points to Calvinism, there are six. But on all six of the points, uh, they're completely wrong, not even close. Mm. But I want to talk about this earnest in verse 14, says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the pur purchased possession. So uh, the earnest, um, it's like when I bought this house. Uh, first, I made an offer and, and had to put up an earnest deposit. Maybe it was $1,000 or something to, with the offer to show them that I was serious about going through with this transaction. But I promised them that I would come up with a balance, either cash or a, a note, so that they, they would be paid in full. And so uh, this is the same uh, thing that, that we have in our, uh, in our salvation. The earnest or the, 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 the deposit that God gives us is the, the first resurrection. Now I know that I saw the comments in the chat about the first resurrection. Uh, I, I know that there's various other ways of um, um, did, did, uh, defining these terms, first and second resurrection. Um, but the way I'm defining it is that this earnest deposit is the first resurrection where our spirit is brought to life, our uh, resurrected to life. Uh, and then, so we're also promised uh, the, the complete, to complete the transaction, we're going to have a bodily resurrection. So the earnest is the spiritual birth uh, resurrection, and then the the final completion is uh, is the resurrection, or the, if we're alive, the rapture. But at some point, we get this glorified body, uh, and that's the completed trans transaction. So we have the earnest deposit, the born again, uh, um, resurrected spirit we have, uh, and now we're waiting for the completion, which is the resurrection of the glorified body. Um, all right, any more, uh, Renee or Cripps? Well, I haven't gone over the verses yet. We, we got uh, a little sidetracked. Oh, with, uh, so, uh, I mean, Renee did a great job, and, and you've added some things, uh, so I won't have to talk about the earnest. I think that's been explained. Uh, in whom we have obtained inheritance, which uh, that part's been explained, being predestined according to the purpose of him. Again, I think it's the the it, it's just saying that he purposed this from the beginning. That It wasn't a... Uh, an afterthought, uh, work of the things that kind of let's say that we should be the praise of the glory who trusted in Christ. Uh, so that trust is extremely important. It's it's not just uh, hearing the gospel and saying, oh, yeah, that sounds good to me. It's trusting in it. Put As Renee said, putting your trust in Christ. You're trusting that uh, when we die, that he has your soul in his hands and that, that you will see him face to face. Uh, in whom you also trusted. Also, uh, both of you talked about the, the, the process that we go through. Um, he starts out with in whom you also trusted, but the next verse says uh, the process, that you heard the word. So we have to hear the word of truth, gospel of your salvation, whom also that you believed. When you believed it, uh, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's that uh, inheritance that he refers to, the earnest payment, which is a promise to, to give us our eternal bodies and to keep our soul with him, which is the earnest of our inheritance on the redemption of the purchased possession. I think we've talked about that enough and the praise of his glory. I think that's where we stopped. Yeah, so I've just kept it brief.
Okay, all right, thank you. Let's, let me see. We got enough time for another verse. Uh, verse uh, 15, uh, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love uh, unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I'll stop there, 17. Interesting. So verse 15, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith, so he's, he's hearing good things about him. He's just saying uh, that he uh, gives thanks for them and he mentions them in his prayers. Uh, and then here's here's what his prayer is, I believe, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you spirit. So he's praying that they receive more wisdom and spirit in the uh, or the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So uh, the more they uh, again, the more they get close to him and learn of him and, and move towards him. I think I mentioned it earlier. Uh, he gives us uh, more wisdom more knowledge. Those are two different things, but here it says spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, learning of him, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. All right. Sister Renee. I want to remind everyone again of what's going on in Ephesus this time. Paul is in prison. Paul is in prison in Rome because he insisted on being in front of Caesar. God had told him that he should preach the gospel unto Caesar, and it turns out you'll see some of Caesar's household were saved. And so when Paul writes this to them, and he says these things, he's in prison. So what he says, <clears throat> the reason he's not there with them and he can only hear about how they're doing is because he's in prison right now. It says, uh, where I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, I love to all saints, like Cripp said, he had gotten a report of them and because of this, he's keeping them in prayer. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He's he's not there able to teach uh, them, but he's heard about their faithfulness, how much they love the Lord, and that they have understanding. And so, as you can see with other churches like the Galatians church, and even the Corinthian church who were carnal babes in Christ, the Galatians church got tricked into thinking that you had to be circumcised to keep the law of Moses. Uh, and so now he's saying that he's trusting God to keep them uh, in wisdom uh, because he's not able to be with them. I, I just wanted to remind you that he is in prison in Rome during this time uh, and is uh, in C near Caesar's household. They probably gave Paul a house uh, and and uh, Caesar's household probably uh, took care of him. And we, we hear about uh, Caesar's household, members of the household uh, because of his imprisonment. I, I just wanna remind everybody, that's why he's writing about things he heard about them because he's not there physically. Amen. Hmm. All right, let me look at it in the Amplified. Uh, let me see. Uh, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I always pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may grant you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation that gives you a deep and personal and intimate insight into the true knowledge of him, for we know the Father through the Son. Okay, that's 17, right? That's why I quit? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what else I can say. It's just really, it's not any deep theology. It's just a wonderful sentiment he's expressing. But I, I guess the important thing to say here is that we could have said this uh, in the very beginning, in the introduction, that uh, I think someone did mention it, that, that this is a letter to believers. 
But I, I do think that uh, uh, we should be able to acknowledge that uh, all, all the epistles, um, everything is written to, to believers. Uh, um, can you think of an exception? Any, any book that was written that was not written to a believer, an individual, or a congregation of believers? Um, maybe the book of Acts, uh, Paul wrote that, I mean, um, uh, um, Luke wrote that to his, uh, this person to give him like a um, apologetics presentation of, uh, look, this is all my research and all my um, uh, eyewitness accounts are recorded here for your consideration. So in that way, maybe he's written, writing the book of Acts to someone that's not a believer. But I think all the epistles, and by the way, book of Acts is, is I would call it an epistle because it's a letter to an individual. Uh, but they're all to believers, uh, and uh, uh, this one is, is no exception. It's to a church, a congregation of believers, and uh, all right, I guess it's time now to start. Uh, let me see if, can we end on a period? Uh, 17, 19, no. Well, gosh, Paul, Paul gets like four, five, six verses without a period. <laughs> oh, man. It's all right to say. I mean, we ended on 17, which is, like you said, a, just a very nice thing that he's telling him. Yeah. All right. Well, let's do that then. Uh, let's uh, start our, our uh, summary and closing remarks now. Uh, um and if in the chat room, um, if you have something you want us to respond to as we're uh, finishing up, um, put it in all caps so we can uh, try to answer your point. Uh, let, let's start with Brother Cripps. Uh, give me your, your summary on the study tonight, Brother. Well, first of all, it was a great study. I, like I said, I like a fresh epistle. <laughs> uh, I, you were asking me before, am I tired of uh, Galatians? Absolutely not. No, I, I, I'm not tired of uh, Galatians at all. There was a lot in Galatians, uh, I think, for all of us. Uh, I just, there's something, I mean, it's, it's true about fiction or, or any kind of books that I read. You know, get a fresh book in your hands and you're you just, you, you don't know what's going to happen. Now, I've, I've read these versus before. But again, as I've said, reading it together with you guys is a different experience to me than uh, when I've read the Bible uh, through myself, uh, just because I, I get a chance to hear different perspectives that I may not have thought of on my own. Uh, and I get to share uh, what I think about it. And I also learn from that. Uh, sometimes I'll go back and listen to a broadcast and, and see what I said, <laughs> make sure that, it, that that's exactly what I believe. Uh, so, uh, it's very beneficial. Um, what I take away from this, there's a lot of stuff, uh, obviously the inheritance and the earnest, uh, those things, uh, I already believe that, but it's, it's encouraging to hear it again. Uh, also, uh, refuting the, the, uh, Calvinistic words in this, uh, that was good, the predestined and all that and explaining what that is. Uh, I've never had to explain that before, but uh, I have some experience doing it uh, again because I uh, grew up with uh, uh, people in, in a Baptist church. A lot of them were pretty uh, strict Calvinists, and they were trying to convert me, trying to explain uh, at, at age 18 uh, when I just wet behind the ears. I thought I knew everything there was to know, but I was completely wrong. Um, so, uh, and also we have the process. We have the process of of uh, uh, how we believe and and what what that process takes on. We hear the word, absolutely necessary to hear the word, and that's how we uh, we seek him by uh, going getting into his word, and then uh, then we believe and we trust the the trust being important too. Um, uh, we can't. Uh, I'm getting in trouble here, probably, but you can't know you can't uh, trust someone you don't know. Uh, and I agree with that. You have to know him. You have to know uh, it's not just hearing the gospel. It's believing the gospel, believing that that uh, that he did all these things and that you add nothing to it, that that you bring nothing to the table. Um, so uh, I think this is a good start. I uh, love the way he starts it out. A lot of times I complain because he spends the first several chapters just greeting him. 
uh, he didn't do that here. He just had a couple and then got right into it. Uh, so it was good. I look forward to next week and I'll say good night to everyone in the chat. Hope all you guys are well. And uh, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, brother. All right, sister Renee. Yeah. You know what? I really like how Paul always starts his letters, man, confirming their position in Christ. Even before he addresses issues with them, even in his uh, salutations, he's confirming their saints. He's confirming who they are, their identity, their promises, something uh, before he even gets to correcting anything or addressing any issues. And this section, I'm actually after this going to do like a five minute video just to explain what earnest is uh, because it is part of our eternal security. Uh, and sadly, if you don't understand your salvation secure, I don't think you understand the gospel. Like, I don't know how you can not understand that salvation itself is to be rescued. And the redemption that's in Christ Jesus is eternal redemption. And he obtained it for us. And so it's only you either trust that he did that or you don't. And, and you're either in Christ by faith or you're not. I mean, you can say I'm he's the Lord of my life and try to clean up your life and all that. But if you haven't trusted him, you don't have the Holy Spirit. That's how you get the Holy Spirit, people. You have trusted that Christ has paid your sin debt and gave you eternal life. And so this section is so important. Uh, because it it's an it's another eternal security verse. Like, like you said, the earnest is the down payment and the promise that will get the remaining later. Amen. So um, you don't get part of an inheritance and then don't get the rest of it. You're either a child of God and have an inheritance with Christ or you don't. It's it's really clear in scripture. So I, I love Ephesians. Again, I think it's important to understand the climate of Ephesus at this time with the Temple of Diana, the fertility and goddess worship going on, as well as Paul's incarceration in Rome so mm -hmm. that we can have an understanding of the context of the background, what's going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, and they believe they date this letter to about 62 AD. Uh, and they believe they call it the prison letter. And off the top of my head, I think it's Philippians and Colossians that he also wrote around the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, um, there's a lot of interesting points uh, in the study tonight. Uh, and as we go forward, there's a lot of important things uh, we're gonna get out of this book of Ephesians. But to the highlight of tonight to me was the verse that, that clarified the order of events. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says that, uh, First we hear, then we believe, then we get the spirit. Uh, and uh, then of course we're predestined because of those things, we're predestined to later on get the, uh, the completion, all the other things. We, we, we will mature, spiritually mature and be perfected. We will physically get a perfected body that's eternal. And uh, so th that's our destiny. We're predestined for those things because we uh, we believed. Um, all right, um, let's take a last look at the chat room and see if there's anything in there to respond to. Uh, ben, uh, while I'm looking through here, give me your uh, summary remarks, please. Well, it was a great introduction uh, to the epistle. I'm looking forward to getting to the meat uh, of the of the epistle, uh, particularly the well, the body. Uh, later on, especially in the next chapter and uh, ensuing chapters, and yeah. uh, I really enjoyed the um, the study tonight. And um, there was something else I was going to say, but I don't remember. Good night, everyone. <laughs> That's good, Ben. I look forward to chapter two as well. Okay. All right oh, then, I was say, uh, Luke. You 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 kind of commissioned me to do uh, kind of look into the Greek if there's any anything that the Greek may yeah. reveal. Um, uh, there's some things in the next chapter that, uh, that I'll probably be doing that more. So okay. don't, don't hope. 
All right, good. I wasn't sure if you had uh, asked you to do too much and you're not able or if there's just nothing yet that's uh, important to mention. Persevere to the end, Brother Luke. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm going to persevere I'm, and I'm going to really persist and make an effort. But the, thankfully, even if I fail, the Lord remains faithful. Yeah, the thing is, the thing is, uh, if you if you truly believe, there's nothing to persevere in. You already believe. You're signed, sealed, and you will be delivered. Amen. Amen. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I guess we'll just uh, see you. On, well, by the way, Renee, you didn't say anything about Thursday. Do you have a program coming up? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Well, I, I really want to discuss this new cuties and the pedophilia being promoted in television now. Oh. Really, who in the hell is a show like this for? Oh. I mean, honestly, if it's for kids, it's promoting childhood sexuality. If it's for uh, adults, it's really gross. So either way, who's it for? Really horrific. So I think we're going to discuss that tomorrow. I haven't talked to Lisa yet, but uh, I think we should get on this. So probably what we'll be talking about. All right. That's tomorrow night, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern? Yep. Okay. All right. And then, of course, come up on Friday, we've got uh, on this uh, same channel, Church of the Eternally Secure, uh, 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. We have our Fun Fellowship Friday. And if you haven't already done it, uh, send us a true false statement so that we can uh, ask everybody to answer it and take a poll. Okay. All right. I uh, enjoy, enjoyed the study and the time with everybody tonight very much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.